Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Iris Masterclass, Elevating Your Camera Skills. Uh, so today uh, we are going to talk about some tips and tricks for uh, operating your various cameras. My name is Lauren. I'm one of the educators here at Iris. I'm joined today by Corey. Corey is also one of the educators here at Iris. You may have seen us in uh, your implementations or various trainings or other webinars. Uh, so again, we appreciate you taking the time to join us today and get a little bit more insight into some things that you can do to make your lives easier as camera operators. So just a few kind of uh, housekeeping things to cover real quick. Uh, this webinar is part of our ongoing support. As you all know, we have a monthly newsletter. We have recordings of our past webinars. We will continue to offer these throughout the year as part of our ongoing support for all of you. Uh, so lots of information and resources available to you. Everyone is on mute for the duration of the webinar. However, we invite you to ask questions at any point. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please feel free to put those in the Q&A box. We will address questions live. If any of your questions are very uh, specific to your organization, then we can follow up on those questions with you later. So don't hesitate to throw those questions in at any time. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, in my introduction, we are going to be offering tips and tricks regarding camera operation. Uh, however, this is not an official training session. We are not going to be getting very in-depth with any of these topics. So this is really just meant to be kind of a refresher and a boost for camera operators who have already been trained. So if you are new to your organization or if you've not been performing exams and you need uh, training, uh, reach out to your manager or your administrator to get added to Iris University so you can watch those training videos and get trained by the staff or Iris, uh, depending on what your organization decides to do. So again, this is really just meant to be a supplement for operators who have already been trained. Okay. Now that we've addressed all of the housekeeping, let's go ahead and get started. So we want to begin by conducting a poll. So we're just curious, uh, you know, IRIS is a camera agnostic organization. That means that we are compatible with any camera type. We have a lot of different clients using a lot of different cameras. So we just want to get a sense of the operators on uh, our webinar today. What kind of camera do you have? So we've got a few of them pictured here. I'm going to go ahead and launch our poll and give you a few moments to answer the question, which type of camera does your clinic or organization have? All right, got some answers rolling in. Lots of Remedio users with us today. Not surprising, that is one of our more popular devices. Good mix of different cameras with us today. We're gonna give a few more moments and then we'll go ahead and stop the poll. All right, so it looks like we've got a majority of Remedio users, about 60%. Uh, then other handheld camera types, uh, the DRS tabletop, and then we've got a few DRS Plus and TopCon users as well. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that information with us. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. So the first thing we want to discuss is uh, the tabletop devices. Um, we won't have a chance to go over every single camera type, but a lot of what we're going to discuss is applicable to many, if not all, camera types. And we'll speak to those commonalities as we're going through uh, the review of the different tips and tricks. Uh, so behind us, we have a DRS tabletop camera. Corey's going to act as my patient while we demonstrate. All right. There we go. Okay. So 
One of the uh, things that I always like to joke about with tabletop cameras, the hardest part of camera operation really does come down to patient positioning. And there's a lot of different things that we really want to be mindful of. Uh, so Corey is helping illustrate even further one of the things that we talk about a lot. So camera height is really important to be mindful of when we are taking images with any tabletop camera. So um, as you all know, with tabletop cameras, we want to make sure that the patient's forehead is against the bar. This is one of the most important positioning aspects of the tabletop camera. We see often image quality is highly affected by the patients not being positioned properly and the forehead resting against the bar is really important. So when an operator is looking at whether the table height is sufficient, it's easier if you come to the side than if you're looking this way. From my vantage point here, this tabletop camera actually looks like it's a pretty good height for Corey. But if I come to the side, I can very easily see that there's no way Corey can position himself in this uh, comfortably and place his forehead against the bar. See how his forehead's back because it's too high. So a lot of times people are inclined to keep the, the tabletop cameras a little too high. So I'm gonna have Corey sit back and I'm gonna bring the camera down, uh, bring the table down, which brings the camera down. A good rule of thumb, when you're standing to the side of the camera and looking at the patient, you want the forehead bar to be about eye level. And the reason for that is we want the be, uh, patient to be able to come forward and slightly down. So I don't want them hunching their shoulders, but I don't want them straining to get up into the chin rest either. I want them to be able to very comfortably place their forehead against that bar and uh, in the chin, their chin in the chin rest. Um, another thing that's very important is to ask the patient if they're comfortable. So once you have situated them and you feel like things look adequate, uh, and they look comfortable, we want to go ahead and verbally ask them. And the reason for that is if your patient is not comfortable, they are more likely to move during the exam. And movement during the exam can also affect image quality, as many of you may know. All right. So once my patient's positioned accordingly, I am ready to go ahead and begin the exam. And so I'm going to go ahead and um, just take a few images of Corey's eyes so that I can touch on one of the last things um, that's important to remember for the tabletop cameras. All right, so you should be able to see our view here. Okay, so Corey is, um, his chin is pressed down on the chin rest. I'm able to start the exam. From here, the camera does all of the work. So a couple of things to be mindful of on your tabletop device. We want to be monitoring the size of your patient's pupil, whether that's a number that the camera gives you or something visual that you can see, you will have an indicator of that pupil size. If at any time you notice that their pupil size is too small, you can cancel the exam and pause to either administer dilation drops or allow the patient to sit in the dark for a little longer if needed. So even though these tabletop cameras are doing all of the work for us and they're kind of automated, if you notice that there's anything that's going to impact your image quality, such as dilation, you definitely want to make sure that you uh, pause the exam so you can address those issues. Same thing when you start to get those image previews. If you see dust or artifacts on the lens, anything that's impacting the image quality, we want to pause that exam, clean that camera lens, address any dilation issues, make sure that uh, we are not ignoring those things. Um, we wanna make sure that we address those in the moment so that our exams are likely to be gradable. Um, another thing I didn't address it while I was on the screen, but that delay, we do wanna make sure that we allow the cameras to have that delay between eyes. That lets the uh, pupils recover a little bit. So when that camera flashes on the right eye, we do want a little bit of a delay between eyes so that the left eye uh, dilation is not uh, impacted as much by the, the camera flash in the right eye. All right, so that uh, camera has completed taking images. Again, um, image quality when it comes to tabletop devices most often are impacted by patient positioning, dilation, and camera artifact artifacts on the lens of the camera. So again, if we see any issues during the exam, we do want to make sure that we address those in a timely fashion. Um, you would be surprised how many images we receive that are not gradable because of those issues. So uh, take advantage of those image previews and um, make adjustments accordingly. 
Now, for the user who has the TopCon, it's very similar to this. So it's still getting your chin and your forehead touching for the TopCon as well. So they are really equal. Now, for the, the camera operators who have the DRS Plus, it's really just moving the eyes just up and down slightly in the goggles because you basically have like a mounted goggles that they're pushing their forehead into. And it's just getting their positions right between the yellow bars so that that pupil is visible for you. Um, if it's a little high, just have them move their face down just a bit. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So a um, lot of the tips and tricks applicable to all the cameras, slight variations depending on your workflow and camera type. Um, but again, with tabletop cameras, making sure that the patient is positioned comfortably and that everything's a good height, um, that'll go a long way in making sure you've got high quality images. So we're going to go ahead and um, move this camera back. And we are going to talk about the handheld cameras. So we're going to be using the bulk device. Um, but much of what we're going to talk about is applicable to the Remedio camera. All of what we're going to talk about is applicable to the other handheld devices that you might have. All right. So with the handheld cameras, this is very much a two-handed operation. Um, so the handheld devices like the Volk and the Aurora, they have an internal light that the patient's going to focus on. Uh, so you can keep the camera in the same hand. Um, that's not true for one of our other devices that Corey is going to talk about here in just a few minutes. Uh, when you're holding the Volk camera or the other handheld cameras in your hand, you want to make sure that you are um, holding it such that one of your fingers is ready to take images um, using the button that's on the front of the handle. So there's nothing worse than getting into position and then you're trying to find the button. Uh, these buttons are very sensitive, so you may at times find that you've captured an image of the floor or your feet, um, totally normal, uh, but you do wanna make sure that you are resting your finger on the button ready to take an image. I personally use my middle finger. I like my forefinger up on the side. To me, that's what feels stable. Lots of operators uh, hold the camera like this, whatever feels comfortable to you. And so just like with the tabletops, we were talking about patient comfort with handhelds. We wanna make sure that you are comfortable holding the device. If you are not comfortable, you're gonna be more likely to take lower quality images. Um, also, we just, we want you to be able to be comfortable while you perform this exam. <laughs> okay, so the uh, second hand that you're going to be using is going to be a bridge to your patient and a stabilizer for the device. So I am right-handed, uh, so I'm holding the camera in my dominant hand. However, if you want to hold the camera in your left hand and support with your right hand, that's perfectly fine. No problem with that at all. Whatever feels comfortable for you. Uh, some operators choose to switch hands, even with the lights uh, that blink internally. So again, uh, we want to make sure that you're comfortable. Okay, so with handheld cameras, uh, we have found that most operators feel comfortable taking images while they are seated. I know that's not always an option depending on the size of your exam rooms or if you're an in-home operator, perhaps you can't sit down. So definitely want to acknowledge that that's not always a, a choice that's available to you. But if you can, uh, we do recommend you be seated in a rolling stool where you can adjust the height of the stool so that you can address the patient. You want to make sure that your supporting hand, you want to make contact with your patient at the beginning of the exam. So we don't want to place our hands on the camera and then come at the patient. I want to make sure I know where my patient is. And you can even start by touching their shoulder and then coming up to their temple or their forehead, depending on which eye you're imaging. You want to make sure your thumb is out from their face. And you can use um, the bridge of their nose as a guideline for the height that your thumb should be at. We want it such that when we land the camera, that's at eye level. And you may have noticed Corey was able to place his entire hand between my thumb and his face. So oftentimes with uh, handheld devices, we see operators, they're inclined to place their um, thumbs close to the face, but I want to be able to land the camera on my thumb. And I can't do that if my thumb is touching his face. So my joke when I'm doing handheld camera operation is I want to do hand and then land. I want to land the device. Uh, and again, my thumb is at eye level so that when I land the camera on my thumb, Corey's eye is already in my field of view. If my hand is low here and I land, I'm going to be looking at his cheek. So my first action is already trying to find his eye. So I want to make sure I'm setting myself up for success. I want to be able to land so that I can see his eye right away. So far, so good? Okay. 
The last thing I want to hit on real quick is addressing the patient at an angle. It is not as crucial for these particular devices as it is for the Remedio camera that Corey's going to demonstrate here in a moment, but it is very helpful to address your patient at a bit of an angle. This allows you to get closer to your patient. If you're trying to come straight on, you're separated from the patient more than if you're coming at a bit of an angle. And you can even take your legs and tuck them to the side of the chair. You wanna keep your arms close by your side so that you're very uh, in control of the device. The longer that your arms are stretched out, the more muscles you're activating, and it's gonna make it more challenging to capture good images um, and feel comfortable. So putting all of these things together, hand and then land. Now Corey's eyes in my field of view and I can press the device toward his eye. Now this camera in particular has a feature um, where the flash is at the top. And so we like to do a technique we call driving up the hill because the flash is at the top of the device that sometimes washes out the bottom of the images such that you cannot see the anatomy adequately. So we have a technique where as you're getting closer and you're pushing the camera toward, we call it driving up the hill. You're gonna tilt the front of the camera up slightly and bring the back of the camera down slightly as you push in and let the retina fill of the screen. So I'm actually gonna have Corey shift his position so that we can demonstrate that to you. Turn this camera off and move the plug. Okay, so I'm coming at a bit of an angle, hand, and then I'm landing the camera on my thumb. And we've got a camera operator here on the side that's gonna help us show you a view from the device. As I push the camera toward Corey's eye, I'm going to drop the back and lift the front as I'm pushing in closer. Okay. We doing okay? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I'm going to change our view. Whoa, there's Corey's face. <laughs> okay. So when I land the camera and I can see Corey's eye in my field of view, I don't have to lift to find his eye. In the center of the screen, we've got a glowing pearl, that glowing orb, that's his retina reflecting back through the pupil. So that's what I'm aiming for. As I push the camera closer, the uh, pupil, is the, the light of the retina, uh, the pupil is at the top of the screen. So here's where I wanna start to drop the back and push the front up. We're gonna drive up that hill so that the retina fills the screen. And once that retina fills the screen and I'm ready to take my photo, I'm gonna tap that button. And here we've got a nice, beautiful image of Corey's retina. We don't have that glare at the bottom of the screen obstructing our view to anatomy. So I would go ahead and that would actually be the only picture I would take. <laughs> We got all the anatomy we needed in the beginning. When I go to take an image of Corey's left eye, if I'm holding the camera in my right hand, using my left hand to support, I'm gonna place my left hand on his forehead so that I can land the camera on my thumb. I would be on that side, that's correct. <laughs> um, if you're holding the camera in your left hand, you would mirror those movements. So on the right hand side is where I place my hand on his forehead and then I will come to the left. Here's where I place my hand on his temple or I can hold. So you've got a lot of um, options in terms of the hands on which you're holding the device and how you're supporting the device. All right, so that is a uh, handheld camera operation. I'm gonna turn it over to Corey so he can talk about the Remedio cameras. Just a reminder, if you have any questions during the webinar, there is a Q&A box at the bottom Feel free to drop those in the chat. We are happy to answer your questions. Oh, it logged us out. All right. I'll go All ahead right. and get us locked in. So uh, this is uh, the Remedio camera. There are two versions. There's a V1 and a V2. And really the main differences between them are your fixation. For the V1, we have an external fixation. There is a glowing dot that we have to adjust to the eye. Uh, the V2 has an internal fixation. So it's like a, a flashing blue screen square that the patient will stare at. So slightly different, but the technique is all the same. So it's all that same camera positioning. It's the same way of how you're 
going to control it. It's just with the V1, the patient has to have their opposite eye open so they can focus on the dot. That allows the anatomy to be in the correct location. And then with the V2, the internal fixation, we do ask that they cover the opposite eye, not close it, just cover it so they can focus on that internal dot a little bit clear. So we're gonna pretty much work with the V2. We just got logged in and we can, we'll be able to share that screen and all that fun stuff. Um, now, one thing we do see uh, from support a lot is there is a setting called device not connected. So she's gonna switch over to the camera for me. I didn't hear her. Oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Try one. There we go. All right, so if you're looking, you can see the camera uh, capture screen. You see in red where it says device not connected. This is not a Wi-Fi issue. This is a Bluetooth issue. The white portion of the camera, you can switch this back real quick. The white portion of the camera has its own battery source and Bluetooth. This houses all the lenses in the infrared. The iPhone is the camera, and this has its own Bluetooth. These have to talk and communicate in sequence. So uh, so that the image is correct what we need right so we're looking through the view of the infrared but when the flash takes place in the camera that's when the iphone kind of takes over but if they're not talking that's where we get that device not connected there are three steps to get rid of this number one if you don't have the white portion of the device on there's a switch at the front it needs to be turned on that's an easy easy fix if it's off so we're going to switch back and i'm going to just turn my device on and you'll see real quick it should go away pretty quick just exactly. Now these two devices are communicating via Bluetooth, okay? Now, if there is a, another time where the device may have been on and it says device not connected, what I want you to do is just turn it off, wait about five seconds and then turn it back on. We're just trying to allow it to kind of, the Bluetooth to shut down and then reawake and talk to each other. Um, the white portion, the Bluetooth does not pull constantly where the iPhone does. Um, so next, the last step is, uh, one more time for me, Lauren. I'm gonna show you, there is a hidden menu on our iPhone. So if you take your finger from the bottom of the iPhone, you slide it up, there is a hidden menu here. Now, if you'll notice there is a Bluetooth icon, so you need to have the white portion turned on. And then all we're gonna do is tap the Bluetooth icon, turn it off, see how it says disconnected, and then I'm gonna reconnect it. And then that should establish that connection properly so we won't have any issue. Slide back device not connected, removed. So it is a Bluetooth issue. And again, support sees this quite often. Knowing these three steps will alleviate a lot of your trouble, you know, when that device is not connected, okay? So next we're gonna move on um, to kind of the camera position, just as Lauren did with the bulk. It is very similar, honestly. Um, it, is, uh, it is a two-handed device. Um, there is, so I'm gonna say these are speed bumps. This is the eye cup. I don't want you to rest your thumb on the speed bumps. I want you to rest it in this little gap here. Okay, so again, two-handed device, you're gonna land on the tip of your thumb. Um, I prefer you, with this camera, you kind of have an axis up, down, left, and right as you're moving in. You wanna have the most, the smallest control or easiest control is gonna be, to me, your front hand, because you can move these and you're just pivoting literally pivoting off the front of the head and you can raise your thumb up and down. So I can go up, down, pivot right, pivot left, and that can control the device. Some dominant people like to control the back. You can still do that, but it's really kind of opposite movements because if the front moves to the right, the back goes left. So you have to think about it. So um, the front, I like to call the light side. We're going always towards the brightness of the retina. The back, you're going away from that. You're going to the dark side, okay? So just uh, one of my little things I like to say. So next we're gonna have Lauren push out. And again, this is uh, having them in a stable chair, a stationary chair is ideal. You sitting down is gonna be beneficial to you for your stability as well. Um, you can stand like if the patient's in a wheelchair or you know they're 10 foot tall, you may have to, you know. but, but it's like you're doing the best you can. So I'm gonna slide over here and start with the right eye. And uh, what is, again, you have the ability, uh, a lot of times coming to the right eye, I like to tuck my knees in because it pro provides me a good stability. This thing weighs about two and a half pounds. So having your elbow as close to your body as possible, again, as Lauren said, if your arm's out here, you're hitting all these different muscles, keep that very close to your body. You're very close so you can build a bridge. You're honestly already coming at an angle. So if you have a square chair, my angle is at the corner of that chair. 
it's very subtle. It's not way over here because she's just turning her eye to me, right? So I have my bridge. And again, this is what I like to control with, but it's about level with the tip of the nose. And definitely she can put her whole hand in between mine. You can see how far away it is. So now when I land the camera, I already see her eye and I see her retina reflecting back. And then all I have to do is slowly move forward and try to keep it as centered as possible. The pupil's kind of like a tunnel and you're just moving in until you get to a spot where you want to capture that image. Corey, do we drive up the hill with this camera? No, we don't. So again, this camera has more of an up, down, left, right axis, but we don't have to drop the back of the camera for this one because this flash is all the way around. It's full circle. So it's not just top heavy or anything. It's very central. So your goal is just to try to keep the retina in the center of your image all the way. And I'm gonna show you some more things when we get to the actual camera. So I'm gonna move over here just to her other side. Now this side, you can definitely tuck your knees, but to me, it's like I'm almost leaning in a little different direction. I kind of like to straddle a corner of the chair because it makes it a little more comfortable for me. I'm right in the middle of her forehead, like my finger is right down the bridge of her nose and my thumb is out by the her tip of the nose. And then I can land the camera and I can see my target and I can just slowly push in until I'm ready to capture that image. So now I'm going to switch over and we're going to talk about some of the other features that you see. Switch over. All right. So now we're at the capture screen. I am set up at my angle on Lauren. And the main reason we want to go at this angle is because the bridge of the nose and the eyebrow creates a ridge. So if you're coming straight in, you're going to be extended. And it also the eye cup's going to want to try to force you to that angle. So we do want to keep it at that angle. So now I'm going to build my bridge. My thumb is about level with the tip of her nose. And when I land the camera, I see her retina reflecting back and I see her eyes. So now all I have to do, and you can see there's a plus sign in the settings if you guys don't have it active, but that gives you, so I know where my center is. Now you can see that hard line on the outside and there's light in the middle. That's the retina. We already see some anatomy. I see the optic nerve. My goal is just to push in so you can see shadows on the outside line. I want to get all the way to the edge. Press that button. And I go black. Hey, with this camera, this is, a, this is actually a great, great thing for, for it to happen. It is not a mistake on you. It's a mistake on the hardware. So seeing how these both these devices communicate via Bluetooth, um, there is a shutter speed on the iPhone that sometimes will take images that aren't acceptable. This one, it took in the middle of the, when the shutter closed on the phone, it took the photo at the wrong time. They mistimed each other. So that's why we have a black image. Sometimes you'll capture an image that's purple and it looks like it has some anatomy, but they're not admissible for grading either because that is the infrared. It took the photo before the shutter closed and the flash. And then of course, if you have an all white one, that's when this camera took it in the middle of the flash. Normally they say about the purple ones, are like one in 50. Uh, normally like for the black ones, we don't see it very often, but sometimes we see it in the very first photo we take. So I'm gonna do this one real quick and just kind of move in and capture it for her. She's covering her opposite eye. There we go. That has all four parts of anatomy that we're looking for. You you have some of your image fields, the macula center, the quality sufficient, everything about this is great. I'm gonna save. And then uh, it moves on to my other eye. I do have to change my fixation. This is the most important thing on this camera. If you don't change your fixation, you're gonna be missing anatomy. It is super important with this camera to change your fixation for the V2. The V1, you're just changing hands, whatever you're taking. All right, so I'm gonna move over here to her left eye and I'm gonna show you just a couple things that I like to show with this camera. Um, just some indicators of issues that you may have. So I'm landing, I'm landed on her left eye and I'm moving in. Now look, you can kind of see her eye uh, open wide for me. You see how that just helped out just a little. I'm moving in and I'm gonna push this in a little closer. This for this camera is a visual indicator. See the hot white? You are too close to the eye. You need to slowly back out. And if you're too far away, you see how that dark circle on the outside of our hard line, all that, that's all the pupil. That's the shadow of the pupil. So you want to fill up that screen. Again, if you push in too close, you're getting that hot white too close. Back out and then capture your image. And another great one. A uh, little blurry. Oh, good. Um, do you want to add anything? Lauren? 
All right. So um, like Corey said, changing the fixation placement for this camera in particular is very important. The tabletop devices and the handheld camera, those internal lights stay in the same location throughout the duration of the exam. Um, but in this camera, we do have to change that fixation. On the uh, V1 version of the Remedio, that fixation is external. So as Corey mentioned, we will need to change hands so that the patient can look at the external fixation point on the camera. Uh, for all of these devices, it is extremely important that we communicate clearly to the patient where they should be looking during the exam. So with the tabletop camera, let them know, hey, there's a light inside the camera. When the camera moves into position, the light will come into view. I need you to focus on that light. Same for the handheld cameras. As you get closer, the patient will see that light. So just let them know, hey, when you see the light inside the camera, I want you to focus on it. For this external fixation point, these do glow in the dark, but sometimes the light that comes onto them throughout the day isn't enough to really get it nice and bright. So Corey's doing something we call charging the dot. When you shine a flashlight on that fixation point, it gets nice and bright. And so you can do that before you go into the dark room. Uh, so that the patient can more easily see this fixation point. Another trick that I'll do when we're taking the exam, obviously we want that fixation point as close to the camera as possible. But if you're bringing the patient's attention to it, you can bring it out, point to it, tell the patient where it is, and then let them follow it with their eyes when you place it into the correct starting location. So patient fixation is another opportunity we see quite a bit. Um, and so while that's not necessarily related to the camera's positioning or your body positioning, it is something to be mindful of. Corey highlighted this. I don't think I did a good job of highlighting it when I talked about the handheld, but for those devices with the internal light where you're holding the camera in your hand, you want to make sure that the patient is covering the eye that you're not taking a picture of. This will help them more easily focus on the light inside the camera. So you might have seen Corey do that or me do that during our demonstration, but I do just want to highlight the importance of that step uh, so that the patient is looking in the correct location and therefore the anatomy shows up in the correct location. Desktops, you shouldn't have to do that. But again, it's still super important to specify and remind the patient of what they're looking for. If they've never done this, they don't know what to look for unless you tell them. So if you've never had your photo taken, somebody take your photo so you can see to have that experience of what the patient is going to experience because without explanation, they don't know what they're looking for or where to look. They'll start looking all over the room because they don't know what they're looking for, or what they're supposed to do, you know, or they may just, you may want them to turn their eyes to the camera when we're at an angle, but if you don't tell them, they could just stare straight ahead because you didn't explain it. So explanation helps because we do see a lot of images that the anatomy is not in the right location. And that's due to either the fixation points chosen wrong for the Remedio V2 or you have not explained it properly to the opera or to the to the patient in order for them to to know what to look for. Absolutely. All right, we do have a couple questions in our Q and A, so we're going to start addressing those. If anyone has any additional questions, go ahead and throw those into the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so one question we received was regarding the image that Corey took of my left eye with the Remedia. Um, they want to know what made that image insufficient. So that feedback that the Remedio camera was giving us, um, it indicated that the image was insufficient. I have a feeling it's because that image was blurry. Oh, blurry. Yeah. Um, I will say it is hard to tell sometimes when we're sharing our screen on the Zoom meeting, uh, the clarity and the focus of the images doesn't always quite match up what we can see here um, on the device. Um, I do also want to highlight that it is important to always ask yourself the three questions when you're taking images, and this is true of any device regardless. Uh, we want to make sure that we can see all four parts of anatomy, that those parts of anatomy are clear and in focus, and that the optic nerve is in the correct location. Uh, and so the image that Corey took of my eyes, uh, we could see all four parts of anatomy. The optic nerve was in the correct location, but that uh, the blood vessels uh, weren't very clear and in focus. So Switching. there was a little bit of a clarity issue there. So she's going to switch back to the camera. So this is the right eye. And as I zoom in, you can really start seeing the detail, which was a sufficient image. And then if we come over here to the left eye, when we see it, you can see, and again, I'm not sure how well Zoom's gonna give you that information, but it looks blurrier, right? 
So again, you are your worst judge. If you get an insufficient image, I want you to be a little extra critical to double check and you can zoom in, you can pinch and zoom that and just see, hey, it looks a little too blurry. Let me try again to see if I can get one. Cause the pupil was beautiful, big, and it made it easy for me to capture. You're gonna be able, I'd be able to capture another one, no problem. Um, but be a little bit more critical. Sufficient doesn't mean it's 100% a bad image. Cause you know, a lot of times I've seen a very gradable image that maybe have a little shadow or a little white in it, you know, that the camera didn't like. It doesn't matter. You can still submit a insufficient, but just be a little more critical of it, you know, just to make sure there's, you know, hey, it looks a little blurry. Let me just retake another one, which I would have. Absolutely. If I was doing that. So to Corey's point, sufficient doesn't necessarily mean that it's automatically gradable. If you've got a clear in focus image, but the anatomy is in the wrong location, it may not be gradable, even though it says sufficient. Same with insufficient. That doesn't necessarily mean it's not gradable, but it does mean we need to take a look at the image and see, you know, is the camera saying that because there's a little shadow on the side, but it's not obstructing the view to anatomy, or is it saying it because the image is blurry and perhaps we need to take some steps to fix that. So you may have heard Corey and I say this in any trainings you've taken part in, but we want you to be the judge of the quality of the image. You are always going to be the final decider, right? The camera feedback is very helpful to have, but we want to make sure that you're judging the quality of the image based on your knowledge of the anatomy and the expectations of a gradable image. All right. Another question we got uh, when I demonstrated the handheld camera, um, they noticed that they um, didn't see the clear image when I took the image, just the orb filling the screen. Um, do you not need to see the final product when you take it uh, or am I going in too far? So one thing to be mindful of with the handheld devices is we are seeing an infrared view. Um, unfortunately, particularly with the handheld device, you're, uh, go, it's a camera view of a camera going through the Zoom meeting. So your view of my demonstration of taking Corey's image is not nearly as clear as what you see as a camera operator when you're taking images. Um, when you're looking at the infrared of the uh, image capture screen on any handheld device, you want to make sure that you have identified that the optic nerve is in the correct location uh, and that you can see uh, a view to the anatomy, there's no shadows obstructing your view to anatomy. However, you won't see that nice clear color image until you tap the button to take the image and that camera flashes. So I could see a lot more clarity on my screen when I was taking the image. Unfortunately, that doesn't always translate with our technology because again, we're, we've got a camera view of a camera screen. Uh, in a Zoom meeting. So um, I hope that helps. Just know when you're taking images, uh, you do want to make sure you're looking at that infrared view that you can see the optic nerve placement and that you're looking for shadows or other obstructions to the anatomy. All right, we've got a new user uh, asking about uh, taking images um, in, in regards to the four parts of the anatomy that, that we are capturing. Uh, so, Corey, I'll go ahead and let you speak to the four parts of anatomy. Okay. So she's going to share again, and we're going to go back to our image right here. So we, uh, every time we take a photo, um, we are looking for four parts of anatomy. Uh, the parts are over here in the right-hand side. There's the yellow orb. That is called the optic nerve. Then we have the superior blood vessel. It's called the superior arcades. That's that blood vessels at the top. And number three would be the inferior arcades, which is the blood vessels at the bottom. And then we have that dark spot right in the middle. I'm going to zoom in. That little spot right there is the macula. So those are the four parts of anatomy. Now, every time you capture an image, you don't have to know the names. You just have to visually interpret them and see that they're visible. Um, especially with the remedio, if it's not visible, you have the ability to take a second photo of that missing part to have a complete anatomy of the eye. But those are the four parts. What I also like to say is the optic nerve is what I call a landmark, okay? It's like if you give directions to your house, you say, hey, turn at the 7-Eleven or convenience store, you're in my neighborhood, right? If they miss that, are they in the neighborhood anymore? No. So we always wanna see the optic nerve in the ideal spot because then all our other anatomy will be in the right location. The ideal spot is if you think of an old analog clock, think of three o'clock for the right, nine o'clock for the left. That's where we always want to see it. If that optic nerve is at four o'clock or five o'clock, it's going to be too low and we're going to be missing that inferior arcade or maybe mo most likely the macula as well. So we're only going to have a couple parts of anatomy. Our goal when capturing an image is to have four parts. If we can do that in one image or multiple, 
so be it. But we just have to present the greater with each of the four parts of anatomy of the eye for both eyes that are available. Absolutely. Um, the parts of anatomy are reviewed in several of our training videos. When you do your Iris University modules, uh, it will cover those. Your clinic also should have um, what we call image quality cards, reference cards that show you the four parts of anatomy labeled, as well as examples of ideal images and images that um, are not ideal and tips on how to troubleshoot them. We have digital copies of those resources as well, so we can always send those out. Um, but you can always reference the videos or those image quality cards for a refresher on the parts of anatomy. Like Corey said, it doesn't matter if you remember the names. It's just very important that you know what they look like and where they're supposed to be. All right. Next question. Um, this user said their largest barriers to collecting good images are patients who have cataracts or droopy eyelids. And so they're asking for some tips on that. So when it comes to patients who have cataracts, there's not a lot that you can do to remedy that because that is a condition that is sometimes obstructing views to the retina so that the images are not always gonna be clear and in focus. If you have a camera, a Remedio camera that allows you to adjust the focus of your camera, you can try to um, capture images that are clearer and in focus uh, by adjusting that wheel. Uh, these handheld cameras and the tabletop devices automatically focus, so that camera is going to do its best to get an image that's clear and in focus. Um, I will say for patients who have cataracts, you should still perform the exam. We do still want to close that gap. We want to give the interpreting provider the opportunity to see as much anatomy as possible. If they see evidence of cataracts, they will indicate that on the images. So if you've got a blurry image and you've already done what you can to try to remedy that, Go ahead and upload the best images you can. If the interpreting provider sees evidence of cataracts or other types of pathology, they will indicate that. So no matter what you're doing, always take the best images you can and upload them so that we can give the interpreting provider the opportunity to let us know if they see evidence of any other conditions. Uh, for droopy eyelids, I will say uh, many times asking your patient to open wide is gonna be really helpful. If you've got someone with extremely droopy lids, you can have them do what Corey just did, lift at the corner of their eyebrow so that you can get a clear image that'll clear that um, lid out of the way. Um, but I will say many times, a few gentle reminders throughout the exam to open wide as you're getting into position will be very helpful in eliminating that lid interference. Again, if you've got someone with very droopy lids or perhaps they have ptosis, take the best images you can. Uh, if you're using a handheld device, you can try to help lift the lid as you're coming in. Um, if you've got a tabletop camera, you could even stand beside the patient and try to help lift their lid uh, to assist with that process. This is another thing where standing is not a good effect, especially with, you know, with the handheld camera or the Remedio, because if you're standing, a lot of times you're going to be standing and towering above them. You're going to be pointing the, the camera down. Remember, like with the Remedio, we want you to kind of go up a hill but you want to be as level with the eye as possible. If you're coming down at an angle, if they have a droopy eyelid, you're going to compound that factor by 10. You know, you're going to make it harder on yourself. We want you as level because you are coming into the biggest part of the opening of the eye. And you know, your interference is from the eyelid that comes from the top. So, you know, you want to be as level as possible or with the bulk, do the uh, kind of go up the hill, the handheld as we were talking about before, but you're trying to just go to the biggest opening possible of the eye. Absolutely. All right. Um, this user has a Remedio camera. Their question is, if the patient patient has had a retinal detachment, should we be taking those pictures or send them to a specialist? So there's no contraindication to performing the exam. If your patient has a retinal detachment, there's no issue with taking images. Uh, however, those images may not be high quality. You may not get a good view to the anatomy. Um, Usually when we're performing this exam, it's because the patients have not been taking their referral to a specialist. Um, my recommendation would be to take the best images that you can. Um, if you would like to leave a note for the interpreting provider to indicate that the patient knows they have a retinal detachment, you could do that. Uh, we do, again, want to give the interpreting provider the best opportunity to see the anatomy that we can show to them so that we have a good idea whether or not that patient has pathology. Um, so again, if you would like to refer them, you certainly can, uh, but there's no contraindication to performing the exam uh, in, the, uh, in your clinic. Just know that you may not always get a good view to the anatomy if that's the case. 
All right. So uh, another question regarding the frequency with which the exam should be completed. Um, is it every six months or a year? Uh, so that's going to depend. The blanket recommendation for patients who have diabetes is to have this exam performed once every calendar year. Uh, so this is not like a physical where you have to wait until the 366th day. It's every calendar year uh, because we want to make sure that we have a good uh, idea of whether or not diabetes is affecting the health of their eyes. So for most organizations, that's the frequency that they conduct the exams at. Um, you would be performing that once a year, you know, when you're uh, when it's indicated that the patient is due. However, if your patient has any sort of pathology, that may increase the frequency with which you perform the exam. So some organizations, if a patient has mild diabetic retinopathy, the care plan might indicate that they come back in six months for an additional exam. So as you're performing those exams, depending on your organization's recommendations and criteria, you may find that you're performing exams more frequently. But to close the care gap, the recommendation is once every calendar year. All right, uh, we've got a request for an email for the point of contact in case there's any questions or problems with the device. Uh, we will be sending a follow-up email to everyone uh, in attendance. We will include the help desk information for you. That information is also available on our website and in the IRIS portal. Uh, so lots of different places. It's also on a lot of the material that you have in your clinic from IRIS. Those image quality cards, for example, have our help desk information. Uh, you may even have a sticker on your camera or your table to uh, give you that information as well. So we will make sure you have that after the webinar. All right. Um, so this user's uh, asking about the Remedio. Um, just a reminder for the Remedio devices that this one right here with the iPhone on the back, we do not have to drive up the hill. This device likes to be parallel with Level. the floor. Level with the floor. So we're not driving up the hill with this device, the V1 or the V2. We want to keep this parallel with the floor. The only devices where we want to drive up the hill a little bit are going to be the handheld devices like the Volk. All right. Got a question regarding utilizing dilation drops. I will follow up with that user after the webinar and provide some resources on that. All right, Corey, we've got a user who has the Remedio V2 with a chin rest. Okay. Um, do we have a preference on which is easier to manage? It's really user preference. Like we could train 10 people and I could have, you know, two prefer the chin rest and, you know, eight prefer that. And I could go the total opposite for the next training group. So it's really whatever preference you have. Now the chin rest does provide a lot of stability for you as an operator because you're not having to do all these little small movements, but you are making all those adjustments to the chin rest as you're moving in. It just provides you a little bit more stability. So if you feel like you are a little shaky or what, but to me personally, and I um, would assume you is that the chin rest is a little bit slower. You know, it's a little more, bit slower, a little more methodical. You're just kind of doing all these little adjustments while you're moving the camera closer, where with the handheld, I have a lot of experience and that just takes practice. And we always stress practice, practice, practice with all our handhelds. But I can take an image very quick. Like when I took the first one that I took was uh, all black, I went up and just set up and moved right in and took the photo. And that was totally handheld. So, you know, it depends on your comfort level. There's no one that's better than the other. One provides more stability, but I'm just as stable with the other one. And I can definitely get a very acceptable image and handheld, but I feel like I can do it in half the time. So for me, speed wise, handheld, stability wise, chin rest, it's whatever you think is best. And honestly, it's best to lo learn both. Absolutely. Because you know, if you have somebody in a wheelchair, you're not going to be able to utilize that chin rest. If you don't know to hand handheld, hand you know, in the handheld without the chin rest, it's going to struggle. Yes. Just as my English. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, definitely user preference, but knowing both, particularly if you have a patient who's unable to maneuver in the chin rest, it's helpful to know that handheld uh, technique. And same thing, chin rest, you have a table that goes up and down. You only have so high and how so low. So maybe you have a very short statured a uh, person who you may have to go to, you know, handheld because the table won't go low enough and the chin rest won't go low enough. Same thing, someone extremely tall, you may have to make adjustments. That's why learning both is best, but whatever you're comfortable with is best for you. Absolutely. 
All right. We have a question regarding um, getting the uh, eyelid interference if the eyelid, it's the bottom eyelid that's interfering. Um, so one thing to note, if the patient, um, the, um, the pictures of the patients are inverted. So if your eyelid interference is showing up at the bottom of the screen, that's actually the top of the patient's lid. Um, but if it is the uh, bottom eyelid that is interfering, um, you can just have them kind of pull down just a little bit. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're not like right next to the eye, particularly if you're using a handheld device with an eye cup, because that is going to interfere with the seal of the eye cup. So we would want that um, to pull down a little bit lower to reduce that eye eyelid interference from the bottom of the eye. All right, we've got a couple of questions regarding um, taking images of uh, patients who are legally blind um, or blind in one eye. Um, so there's a lot of varying levels of blindness. Um, legally blind does not necessarily mean that the patient can't see through their eye at all. Um, even if they can't see through their eye, it is helpful to go ahead and take images. And the reason for that is um, we want to make sure that, again, we are giving the interpreting provider the best opportunity to see whether there's any pathology happening uh, behind the scenes. So um, when diabetic retinopathy is present, that is an indication that the blood vessels and the vasculature in other parts of the body are being affected. So while Iris's mission is to end preventable blindness, there is a clinical value in taking images of patients, even if they're legally blind, because we can see what's happening behind the scenes, because this is checking the health of their eyes and looking for those types of conditions. So um, my recommendation is always to take the best images you can with the tools that you have. You do have the option to go into the iris portal, into the camera operator application, leave a note for the interpreting provider, let them know if the patient is legally blind, maybe that's impacting their fixation. Um, and you can let them know, you know, you've taken the best images and that's the condition that the patient has. Um, but we do, again, want to make sure that we are doing our best to capture images. We don't want to disregard one of the eyes or not perform the exam just because the patient has vision issues already, um, because we may be able to determine uh, through that exam that there are other things happening. Uh, and we, again, want to make sure that the patient has a good idea what's happening with the health of their eyes. All right. Um, question regarding if a patient receives um, an indication that there's pathology, their results come back, they have pathology, uh, will they come to get the test done the following year or will they follow up with the specialist? And again, that's going to depend. So any indication of pathology is going to result in a referral. That patient is going to be directed to follow up with an eye specialist for further review. Um, and that time frame of the referral is going to depend on the severity of the finding. Um, however, I unfortunately have seen where patients did not follow up with specialists after they received indications that they have pathology. Um, so you would want to make sure that you're following up to find out, did that patient get treatment? Did they see a specialist? Is that specialist taking over uh, their annual diabetic retinal exam? Um, because that may not always be the case. So it's really just important that we're in communication, that we have a good understanding. Did they take that referral? Did they follow up? In the uh, subsequent years, are they having those exams performed um, by their eye doctor? Or is that a gap that still needs to be closed? All right. Um, so a uh, question regarding contraindications where we shouldn't use the Remedio V1 camera. No, there are no contraindications to using any camera. There is no condition that would preclude you from taking images of the retina. Uh, there's no contraindication to performing this exam. All right, last question. Uh, where can we do the Iris University modules? So those modules are located in the Iris portal. You want to make sure that the administrator or the manager at your organization has added you as an IRIS user, and then you will be able, uh, you'll get an invitation to the portal. You'll be able to access those videos and watch them. Uh, in our follow-up email to you, we'll include the help desk information. If you have any challenges or issues with that process, you can always reach out to IRIS, um, but that should start with your administrator or your manager adding you to the portal so that you have that access. All right, that's all the questions that we've received. Corey, anything you'd like to add? No, I think we did a good job. I think I, if you guys have any questions, please 
hit up our support team. Um, you'll get some contacts. Lauren, we'll make sure you all get our contacts as well so you can reply to us, um, to the training team and stuff. And uh, But we're here to help. We want you to succeed. If you guys ever have little little things that you want, hey, please hit us up. We want to help you guys succeed. Um, the only other thing I want to know is just practice, practice, practice. If you have a handheld, the more you practice, the easier it becomes. Um, if you put it down for a day, day will turn into two weeks and then you forget everything you know. So um, very much like riding a bike, just, you know, if you put in the work in the beginning, it gets real easy and you won't have to problem. You don't have to practice every day after that. Absolutely. The more you do exams, the easier it becomes. And we're out there saving people's sight. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for being part of our mission. Thank you for all that you do. If you need anything, like Corey said, please reach out to us anytime. We are here to help. We do want you to succeed. And again, we thank you for taking the time to join us today. Hope you all have a wonderful afternoon.